Due Process, winner of 22 regional Emmy Awards, including the 2012 and 2013 Mid-Atlantic Emmys for Outstanding Discussion Series. Due Process is a presentation of Rutgers School of Law Newark and the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. Studio facilities provided by the Rutgers ITV Studio, Division of Continuing Studies. Nine innocent black teens accused by two white women, convicted of gang rape, sentenced to death, jailed for long years in a case that made headlines around the world. A case that triggered two high court decisions and became a symbol of Southern injustice. The Scottsboro Boys, all dead, now pardoned eight decades too late. And the focus of this edition of Due Process. Major funding for Due Process provided by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. Additional funding from Genova Burns and the New Jersey State Bar Foundation. countless cases of Southern injustice, of black men falsely accused of raping white women, of lynchings, legal and otherwise, of innocent black defendants imprisoned and worse. We're talking today about the infamous case of the Scottsboro Boys, nine black teens who double damned by depression and Jim Crow, guilty of nothing more than riding the rails, found themselves sentenced to die. They've been dead for decades, but late last year, the state of Alabama issued posthumous pardons the Scottsboro Boys exonerated more than 80 years late. I'm Raymond Brown. And I'm Sandra King. On this edition of Due Process, how they were framed, how they were freed after long years in prison, and how players as varied as the Communist Party, the NAACP, and the U.S. Supreme Court all played a part. And to help us sort out their story, what it meant to America then, and how far we have or have not come since, Rutgers Law Professor Taja Nia Henderson, an expert on race and incarceration, and Rutgers Newark historian James Goodman, author of the seminal work, Stories of Scottsboro, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Welcome to Due Process. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you so much. Jim, I'm going to start with you. This is uh, a story that comes up whenever I hear a debate about the trial of the century from my point of view. No matter how you measure the years going back, this is a paramount story, historically, politically, legally, in terms of the movement for freedom. So we're going to ask the unreasonable thing. And I've conferred with Sandy. I would do this on my own. In 60 seconds, tell us the story of Scottsboro. Okay. Nine black teenagers riding on a freight train, get in a fight with some whites who try to throw them off the freight train. The whites get the worst of the fight, complain to a station master. They pull over the uh, train. They round up all these kids. There's a charge of rape, which we can talk about how that might have happened. There is, within two weeks' time, four trials. Eight of the nine of them are convicted in two weeks' time, indicted tried, convicted, and sentenced to death, and then that starts a worldwide cause celeb. A charge of rape because when the black teens are pulled off the train, two white women in overalls are pulled off too. Someone says there's been a rape, they confirm it. Yes, my instinct is, and this is just goes beyond what we have evidence for, is the two white women, Ruby Bates and Victoria Price, they were trying to get away. They thought the posse was as likely after them as after the black kids. They're trying to run away, but the posse stops them thinking they're dressed as overalls at first that they're men. My instinct is that the posse assumed nine black kids, probably more black kids, some of them probably ran away, two white women, something had to have happened. That was the 
instinctive reaction. And someone said to them, did those black boys bother you? Tajania, the, there's a, a, a paramount, a critical legal opinion that comes out of this whole experience that Jim has so graciously and effectively summarized in actually 90 seconds, <laughs> uh, Powell versus Alabama. Uh, what's that case about and how does that relate to the larger drama? Powell has uh, the distinction of probably being one of the, the, the most uh, commonly, widely taught constitutional law cases in the country. Law students everywhere learn about Powell. They learn about the Scottsboro Boys through Powell. The case is really about the speed with which these teenagers were brought to trial. None of them had the opportunity to seek counsel. None of them had the opportunity to confer with counsel. You have some, you have a group. So the, the, We're think, talking days. We're talking days. Yeah. Less than two weeks, really. Less Less, than I think weeks. it's 10 days. Yeah. So 10 days from, in, you know, from sort of rounding them up to indicting them to trying them to convicting them and, the and convicting opinion, them in four days. Yes. And the Supreme Court opinion has an interesting colloquy. Non-lawyers should read it too because you can see how unclear it was who actually represented the defendant. Right. You have, there's this, this uh, in the transcript, there is a gentleman who had come in from Chattanooga who talks with the judge. Well, I don't really represent them. I'm not really a member of the bar, but I want to be here as assistance. Is it okay if I assist the court with helping these young men with present their right. case. And the judge had sort of appointed the whole bar, which meant no one was appointed. No one right. was appointed. Jim, before, they hadn't even spoken to their parents. Before we get into the nuances of this, and there are thousands of nuances, in a sense, the fact that they weren't le um, li literally lynched is interesting here. I mean, how close did this come to being nine young men hanging from trees? And isn't that one of the surprises of this case? Well, it is one of the surprises. The only reason that we know about this case almost, or, or just one more lynching out of the 5,000 lynchings between the end of Reconstruction and the Depression is because they were put in the jail, which would have been easy to break into, but the sheriff was of Jackson County was an anti-lynching sheriff, and there were anti-lynching sheriffs. And the governor, Benjamin Meeks Miller, was an anti-lynching governor. The sheriff called the governor, the governor called the National Guard, and the National Guard e easily dispersed a crowd that had gathered around the courthouse. It was also a cold night, and uh, that might have contributed to it, too. So in Powell, we get uh, the question of effective, ineffective mm -hmm. counsel, and then all hell breaks loose in who's going to defend them next. Mm -hmm. And you get this fascinating war between two um, not so comfortable with each other entities the Communist Party, and the NAACP. So how does that play out? Oh, it is just this bitter fight for two years. The ILD, the legal wing of the Communist Party, their idea is that this becomes a battle in the courtroom as well as in the streets. And they want to organize petition drives and protest marches and every kind of demonstration all over the world. Well, we saw at the, at the top of the show how many people they were able to pull out for these demonstrations. Exactly. The NAACP, they are finally becoming a respectable organization. In 1909, they were not a respectable organization. Respectable African Americans did not protest uh, inequality. And they also didn't have a strong Southern presence. And they had almost no Southern presence. They were just laying the groundwork for the great legal battles that would end in Brown v. Board of Education. They were dealing with students, not even undergraduates or elementary school students, you know, but um, college students. So. Uh, so they were not prepared, and they also were nervous. The newspaper headline said nine black fiends raped two white women. That is what most people read in the newspapers. That wasn't the kind of thing the NAACP was going to want to jump on. Before we go back to Tanya, I think it's obvious that we've got to talk about this, this mixture of race and sexuality. Uh, the 5,000 lynchings, and in fact, lynchings did the first year without lynching in the last century, it was 1956. So, and the overwhelming majority were involved with allegations of black men and white women. So that was dry tinder and a continuing theme in much of the lynching and unjust activity in the South. Absolutely. That is the matrix around this whole thing. So, so the culture that has that great fear about black sexuality it affects jurors. 
And it turns out that the issue of what kind of people should be jurors also goes up on appeal from the Scottsboro experience. Tell us about that. Sure. So you have um, the actual physical juror roles, so which is a list of names and addresses of people who were qualified to serve as jurors, which did not include any black people. And after the, the teens had been sort of brought to trial and it was apparent that this was going to be an issue, it appeared that these names had been sort of added post hoc. So whereas there had been red lines written through these red, you know, slashes through the last lines on the pages, these names had been written in. And the Supreme Court says the, this, this, the veracity of these roles is now called into question. And the Constitution will not stand for black people being um, arbitrarily excluded from the voter rolls. This is an arbitrary exclusion. There's no reason that these people weren't added other than their color, and that's sufficient enough to overturn a conviction. But interesting, I think, Tajania, to look at how and why this ever gets to the Supreme Court in either Powell or Norris. And I think we can assume that what the Communist Party was doing in New York and elsewhere and Europe and you know, the, the, the hullabaloo that was raised around this case, as opposed to all the cases we don't even know about sure. that were very similar to this, makes the court feel the pressure to do something. You know, it's, it's an interesting question, sort of, w when the court decides to grant cert, especially on an issue involving a Southern court and the, the legitimacy of a Southern court conviction. You don't see, you don't see a, a lot of these, but you see several. You see them in the 30s, you mm -hmm. see them in the 1880s. I mean, you sort of, as the court deals with the ramifications of Reconstruction, really the failure of Reconstruction, the Supreme Court has not closed its doors to cases involving allegations that Southern courts have not lived but up not to a, their... But not a liberal court. No, absolutely, absolutely but, not a liberal you, court. One of the interesting things about your book, The Stories of Scottsboro, which we urge everybody to read, um, talks yeah, and, about and, the and fact... We should, and we should note, by the way, that Jim also teaches creative writing, and you can see that in the writing. Oh, it's yes. well written, but, it's but, but it's stories, just and it explores work. things that are counterintuitive, like the fact that there were, even within the South, white Southerners who were appalled at the image of the South that would be in portrayed as illegally lynching men accused of a crime. Right. And even Justice Sutherland, who writes the opinion of Powell, is from Utah, very conservative. Charles Evans Hughes, the Chief Justice, had conservative Republican credentials, although he was a complex man. So there were a lot of wheels within wheels that sort of served in a serendipitous way to keep this alive as a legal and a political issue. Absolutely. If, whenever someone says that everyone thinks one way, Distrust them. <laughs> There's incredible conflict within the South. This whole idea of a monolithic South is absurd. There's Southerners who are middle class and upper middle class who are trying to modernize and industrialize. They want business to come to their town. Lynching is not good for business by the 1930s or some businesses. One of the things that you talk about is that Leibowitz, the northern Jewish lawyer who's mm -hmm. willing to involve himself in all this both as a lawyer and with the politics, himself had a rather reactionary D.W. Griffith view of the South when he first came Absolutely. He thought that there, he could convince any jury. He looked at the evidence and he didn't see color. He didn't buy into the myth of the black rapist. So he assumed that anyone, anywhere, he'd never lost the case. He'd only had one hung jury. And uh, the, you know, the cliche was that uh, if you hire Leibowitz, you must be guilty. And how interesting that the Communists bring him in, although he's not a friend of theirs. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and it was the biggest way to rebut then or now the idea that the it was often charged by the NAACP themselves that the communists only wanted to see the defendants executed because that would prove that capitalist courts were corrupt and there could be no justice. But in fact, the best way to rebut that is to point that they picked a defense lawyer, the best, the F. Lee Bailey or the Johnny Cochran of their, of their time uh, to defend them. Who thought he was going to be able to easily win and found out time and time again that he couldn't. Yeah. Well, the other interesting issue is that the communists actually changed their line. I mean, the issue of, and one of the, again, one of the reasons for reading your book, and I have no financial interest in this, although I'm available, <laughs> but is that you had a complicated question involving caste and class in the South. And 
The communists decided that the best way to convince white workers who were kept at odds and at loggerheads with blacks was to convince them that the legal system was unjust yeah. so they would turn against capitalism. Yeah. So they actually wanted acquittals, yeah. contrary to the allegations of the NACB and maybe contrary to their initial ideas. Right. So it was a very complicated landscape in which this yes. takes place. And changing constantly by, by virtue of local conditions, but also by virtue of things going on around the world. I mean, this was, a, by 1935, the communist party popular front opens up and communists are rushing to work with other groups and that made it. You also have sure. the, the advent of the Southern Tenant Farmers mm -hmm. Union in Alabama which makes a difference. I mean the, the STFU is probably I think the first interracial labor union in, in the U.S. and you have black farmers and white farmers all dispossessed from the land, all working for other people who are working together, who are working not only in Alabama but also in other places with a national organization to really improve the conditions that all poor farmers are suffering under. That's and so true. Alabama is special in That's this really way. That's why this would make such a wonderful teaching experience because, for example, if you go to the Lorraine riots in Arkansas, which come to the Supreme Court in 1928 as a legal lynching example, again, questions of class and rural sure. poverty and how all these things and the organizers, some of them starting out as pretty progressive and winding up as lynch mob leaders. Mm -hmm. I mean, a very complicated array of things, which leads me to ask you whether, uh, have we moved away from a close alignment of race and incarceration as issues in American life? Or are we still there? Oh, I, oh we're definitely, we're definitely <laughs> oh, right. still there. And even if we aren't, even if we see the amelioration of some of these conditions, even if we see the statistics improving over the past 10 years or the past 15 years, I think that, that there, is, there, is, there is no one who can convincingly argue that the war on drugs in the U.S. has not led to a disproportionate um, plague or epidemic of incarceration and criminal justice involvement among people of African descent. And, and that's a problem that we still live with. So even if people aren't, aren't I know there, there are some critics who say, well, you know, if you look at the prison populations now, there's a, there's a meth population that's really, or a meth offender population that's really kind of changing the racial dynamics. Well, sure, that's true. But once you sort of cycle out millions and millions of people, what happens to them Next, and that's sort of one of the things that I that I work a lot in my scholarship. We have a lot of people, people of color, and sort of absolutely majority of folks too. We have a lot of people of color who are still suffering under this stigma, this this stamp of of criminality, and that's almost impossible for them to get Reentry is one of the areas yes. that yeah. that you look at. Yes, absolutely. And um, you know who gets the worst of it? Yes. Who, who gets it at all, right? <laughs> so if you, if you look at the notion that we have, I mean, unless you assume that blacks and Latinos are inherently more criminal than others in the population, you have to ha find some way of looking more deeply into who is incarcerated. We don't want to look at that. We don't talk about Scottsboro very much except occasionally rhetorically now because it's a very awkward and uncomfortable story. And so is there something you see holding this together, uh, some unwillingness to look at the role of race mm -hmm. in our view of what constitutes criminality, both its root causes and the ways to address it? Absolutely. I mean, I agree with you completely. I'm all for pardons and I'm all for going back and apologies, but I have this, I'll say it here, but I've tried not to say it too much. <laughs> I wish we'd spend more time making sure that there aren't things for us to apologize for 50 years from now than actually going back. I mean, well, why do you I'd think like we're so unwilling to have an honest conversation about factors that are clearly part of who we are and how we view criminal justice as an antidote to social disharmony and social threats? It's just so difficult for people to come to terms with the degree to which we still breathe, eat, and sleep For example, when Ruby race. Bates recants, yeah. there are obviously And becomes people, a communist. Right, mm -hmm. who can't accept the fact that she's telling the truth that nothing happened. Yeah. Uh, you have the case of Wright, who was just recently pardoned. When the prosecutors asked for life, the jury wanted to give him death. I mean, so you have cultural attitudes that are pretty deep and resistant to really being facile and open about what are fairly obvious problems yeah. and how we think about it. Yeah. So I, I wonder, too, in addition to the the more obvious um, race, class, incarceration, um, unfortunate uh, state of, of criminal justice in this country. What about cases that are more directly parallel to this? Do we assume that this is all over and that black defendants in the South don't get railroaded any longer? Mm -hmm. 
you know, I think I think defendants everywhere are are vulnerable or susceptible to being railroaded. The the state of public defense in this country is really abysmal. And you know, one of the one of the 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 the, the gifts that we get from Powell is that if the if if the defendant cannot choose his own and pay for his own counsel, then the state must provide him counsel with enough time for him to, to adequately prepare. This sort of notion of state provided counsel is really under attack. We recognize that, that there is a right to counsel in criminal cases is sort of what we get. We get it from, from Powell, we get it from, from Gideon, we recognize it. But the, the availability of funding for, for that for the provision of that service is really always, always vulnerable to politics. And when you have politics that's allowed to, to limit or circumscribe constitutional rights, I think we have a problem. And we in New Jersey have a, a, a better picture when it comes to, to counsel being provided for poor people. But what about the rest of the country, and particularly uh, parts of the South. I mean, you know, the the an organization that that operates out of Montgomery, the Equal Justice Initiative, which is run by Brian Stevenson, who's a, a professor of mine when I was in law school. They are working regularly to improve the the chances, the the life chances of folks who are convicted or or accused of of crimes in in the Deep South. Sort of this is Deep South, you know, Alabama, and. Um, it's tough. It's tough. As funding gets cut, public defenders are overwhelmed, and they aren't able to provide the yeah. kind of counsel that one might want to see if one is facing death. They aren't able to provide the kind of counsel that you or I or, or any of us here would, would, would wish we had. But does it, that hammer fall harder on black defendants? I think it falls hardest on poor defendants, poor wherever defendants, they are. Poor defendants, exacerbating problems of false confessions, yes. which the more, more we study confessions, the we, the, e the easier we learn it is to get a false confession, to yes. produce a false confession, exacerbating the problems of false IDs or mistaken IDs. And so it is. Or it's, save uh, yourself IDs. We know that three of the Scottsboro boys um, testified against. Absolutely. You know, the others. Because it was made clear that, you know, they were going to die, and so you do what you can to you save can, yourself. You can, and they were batted around, and we know that prisoners, uh, people accused of crimes, are still batted around. Absolutely. So. I mean, you know, the Central Park Five, sort of yeah. to bring it home, yeah. the Central Park Five, this exact thing happened. You have teenagers accused of something that they did not do, who are coerced the by the police. The jogger case for those right. who... Yes. Race, who are, race and Right, class, absolutely. So, yeah. these, are, these are boys of color, black and Latino boys, who are coerced by the, by the police to to make incriminating statements about each other. Because, because they're told you can go home. Absolutely. And it also fits home. our notion of what crime looks like. Sure, in sure. Yeah. Let me ask you this question. We try to be objective for due process, as our name implies. Mm -hmm. It's obvious that, although that we do think this is an important case, and I think we'd like to encourage the pedagogical use of it. Mm -hmm. Briefly, what's the connection between this and To Kill a Mockingbird, which might make it a teaching tool for people? Um, well, there's a, there's a debate among the literary biographers, mm -hmm. but it is said that Harper Lee was we know that she would grew up in Alabama at this Certainly time was aware of this case and was aware of this case and it is said that it influenced her in such a way if she was one of the middle class southerners shot and by partly her. because judge horton who was one of the judges along the way became converted to the notion that these men were not getting yes. fair trials and at one turn overturned a verdict as a yes. trial judge yes he uh, he is convinced by the evidence and in the middle of 1933 in Ju june 33 writes the most reasoned Took a huge opinion. amount of courage. Huge well, the amount end of, of his judicial career. He, he, it's the end of his career because they had elected judges and he was soundly defeated in the next election. So we've got a minute left and Jim, you made reference earlier to how you prefer that we avoid situations <laughs> where we have to have um, apologies uh, 50 years down the, down the road. But I wonder how you feel specifically about this case. We know the families didn't show up mm -hmm. when these pardons were granted. Why do you think that was? And as some people um, have said, this is really, this, is, this goes beyond uh, justice delayed, justice denied. This is a farce and uh, keep it, it's 80 years too late. It's such a complicated case, but the families that have been actually located are not the families of these three pardoned. They were all pardoned in many of the newspaper headlines, but in fact, Alabama would only pardon the three. Charges were dropped against five. 
Um, and then Norris had, Norris been, had been part by George so that, Wallace, we should say. By George Wallace. I, another so, irony of this case. So that it wasn't actually the families of the threes. We've had such a hard time even identifying and locating. We had to prove that they died to offer par posthumous pardons. Even that. These were anonymous people who became anonymous Gotta again. Gotta stop you there. Sure. The Scottsboro Boys, a story worth a look back which might just inform the state of justice going forward. So our thanks to Professors Tajania Henderson and James Goodman thanks of Rutgers, and our thanks to you for watching. If you want to join the conversation, visit us on our website or talk to us on Facebook at facebook.com slash TV. And be sure to join us next week and every week for critical issues of law and justice. Till then, for Sandy and associate producer Tanya Ivanova, I'm Raymond Brown. See you next time. even more insight on law and justice? Become a fan of Due Process on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and watch us on demand on YouTube.